Folks, it's my pleasure to introduce Tim Eckert to come up here. And folks, would you welcome him as he comes forward? And Tim uh, does ministry, and uh, primarily it's been in Indonesia, but it's expanding. And he's going to share a little of that with us today. And um, a lot of you know we had a commissioning prayer for Janie Brinkman, who's headed over to Indonesia. And so here we go, right out the gate, we got somebody coming here that's got a little connection there as well. And um, I just want to pray with Tim before we get into the Word together. He's going to share a little bit of an update and then guide us in the Word here this morning. So would you pray with me for Tim and our time together? Father, we thank you so much for this time of worship as we now hear from your word, and I pray as Tim shares an update of what you're doing in and through him and his family, we just pray for a blessing upon his words. And I pray that we would lean in as a congregation to hear the heartbeat of what you are doing with the people that he's coming into contact with day in and day out. And Lord, I know his wife is is in Des Moines area, and she's a part of some ministries taking place this morning. Bless her as she's interacting there, and and Lord, guide them and lead them. We thank you for Tim being with us today. And we just ask that you'd use him and that we would lean into your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Well, it is a privilege to be with you this morning. Um, in fact, your, your pastor doesn't know it. We actually uh, shared a moment uh, that was kind of funny. Uh, your pastor called me earlier on in the week just to you know, finalize some things, and as I'm standing in line at the DMV is when he called, and I knew it was him because it came up on my phone that uh, it said charity uh, from Palmer, Iowa, charity call from Palmer, Iowa, so we sat and talked, and I kept letting people pass ahead of me because I was still on the phone with him, you know, and, and uh, as we closed, he says, I would love to pray with you. I'm like, oh, that would be great. He goes, how about you start off, and I will finish. Okay, in the middle of the DMV, here we go. So we, <laughs> I pray, and I'm like, you know what, I can be bold. I don't, I, I don't mind that. Uh, we get done praying, say amen, hang up the phone, and I look, and everybody's staring at me. I'm like, hey, all right. So <laughs> oh, it is a privilege to be with you. Um, any of you guys remember me ever being here? I, yeah, man, you guys are old timers then, because I, I try to remember, it has to have been, Probably 10 years since I was last here. Now, my wife, on the other hand, was here probably five or six years ago. Uh, any you guys remember the missionary to the boogeyman? That's a story most people remember. Anyway, that was us. Um, my family here on the screen, this is uh, my beautiful wife, Doris, is down at Glad Tidings Assemblies of God in Des Moines doing their missions convention this weekend. Uh, then we have... Right next to me is my son, who's 16, and now it's actually an old picture. He's now almost 6'5", 290 pounds, uh, big kid. Uh, on the far right or far left for you guys is Ariana. Uh, she just turned 15 in September. And the Gracie smack dab in the middle there, she just turned 13 on Thursday. So I'm no longer a parent of any children. They're all teenagers, so pray for us. No, I've got great kids. I love them to death. Um, so as Pastor mentioned, we... Spent 13 years in Indonesia. I absolutely love Indonesia, and I'm so thankful for your church's support. And a lot of times when we come to churches, if they're new churches, uh, we'll just give what we're doing now. But I feel a need to give you guys a, a little bit of an update on our, you know, of what happened our last term. Um, you know, God did some crazy cool stuff. Uh, you know, we spent 10 years in Indonesia before going into our last term, and I often refer to it as like walking through a swamp. You know, you, you guys have walked through those boggy, muddy, you know, cornfields after being plowed and it rains for four days and, you know, you just, every step is hard. You have a destination, you know where you're heading, but it's just taking a long time to get there. And someone once told me, said, Tim, it takes 10 years before you really start seeing breakthrough in Indonesia. And I can contest to that. At 10 years, we show up for our, our third term in Indonesia, uh, and God just did some miraculous things. I had a, a friend who we just met. She's from uh, South Carolina. She was helping a, a Muslim friend rebuild her family's house, and she said, Tim, do you, can you come over and help me do some piping, some, some water? Work? You know, um, growing up on the farm, you guys, I know, I know there's some of y'all farmers out here, you guys understand this. You become a, a jack of all trade, a master of none, right? I mean, you can do just about anything. Well, I swear 
My enemy, besides the devil in, in, in Indonesia, was piping. I was always fighting. Anyway, she, she asked me to come over and help do some piping, uh, some pipe work and stuff. And uh, so she had a driver who was a Muslim fellow that named uh, Ruslan. Ruslan was a great guy, younger guy, about mid, probably early to mid-20s. Um, he drives, drives us over there, and we need some fittings. So me and Ruslan go get some fittings from the hardware store. As we're driving over there, Ruslan goes, now, you're a pastor, right? And I said, well, yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a pastor. He goes, can you answer me this question? I believe Jesus is a prophet, but how is Jesus God? Now, I don't know if you understand the Muslim world, but those kind of questions don't come up. You know, we studied in uh, Sunday school about the Jewish culture and how they are, I mean, shunned to even bring up the subject. And it's very similar to Islam. Uh, you know, for, so for him to ask me this question, it was just super awesome. Well, from that, was able, we were able to birth a, uh, what's called Discovery Bible Study. It's a, it's a process in which you uh, go through the Bible and you, you it's very... Um, adapted for, for Muslims to be able to do this. And so I had him and six of his friends every Saturday morning. We'd, we'd meet at Melinda's house and have some donuts, and, and we'd get through the Bible, and all of them at the end of the, our, our time together, they'd say, I love Jesus. Now, they still wouldn't profess that he was God, but those seeds were planted. We just had things like that time and time again. Uh, if you go to the next slide there, that... The island we were on was the island of Sulawesi. It's the, if you look on the Indonesian map, it's smack dab in the middle. Uh, in fact, the city we were in was in the city of Makassar, and it has the geographical center point of Indonesia was about two miles from my house. It was super cool uh, that that's where we were. Um, while we were there, we moved to Makassar from Palopo this last term, and God started speaking to my wife. Well, he's probably speaking to me. I just didn't want to listen to him. But I uh, uh, started telling my wife, we need to start an English service. Now, I, I, if you know me at all, I'm very much, I do not like to be tied down. And I've seen the, the, the English churches. And you, the, it's someone who pastors there is just, I mean, they, they can't break away. You know how it is. Start trying to get away as a pastor, period. You know, it becomes very difficult. And I'm like, nope. My wife kept going. I really think we're supposed to do this. Finally, in April, I said, look, I'm, I'll take a month, and I will earnestly pray about this. And uh, after a month, God said, you know, I, I knew God was calling us to, to start an English service there. So I told my wife, I said, here's the deal. If we're going to do this, you're doing it with me. You're co-pastoring with me. My wife's a phenomenal preacher, by the way. She, you know, so, uh, and she said, okay. And I, because I was like, so when I'm not preaching, I can, I can go if I want to go. I'll go preach in the Indonesian churches. I go out to the villages. I want to do that kind of stuff. And I found every time I was away from our church, I just wanted to be back with my people. I just, well, I just had this, this pastor's heart come over me for my people. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, this is All Nations Fellowship. Now, it's kind of hard to see here, a little blurry, but I don't know if you notice how many pictures there are people in hijabs, in the, the Muslim garb. Uh, we actually, it was awesome, because we met in the back of a cafe, Muslims were free to come, uh, because it wasn't a place of worship, and they, a lot of them come to better their English, was their purpose, some of them was actually from our Bible study, uh, the bottom right with the candles was actually our WM's uh, Christmas service, district Christmas service, and my wife shows up with all these Muslim ladies, and they didn't know what to do with her, but it was super awesome, because it encouraged them, they said, we can reach out to them as well. And God used All Nations Fellowship. It was always a small fellowship, uh, but God used it in just really awesome ways. We baptized a number of Muslims coming through there. Um, the next slide is, <clears throat> is a picture of the REACH Center. The REACH Center stood for Reading, English, and Conversation Hangouts. Uh, the middle picture there is my son. The kids thought they, they was a jungle gym. We, we opened up this place in the middle of a Muslim village or a neighborhood. In fact, three doors down was a Muslim homeschooling 
co-op thing that they had going on. But these kids would come over after school, and we had uh, English library that they were able to go through and be able to read in. And we had our MAs who didn't speak very well in the Indonesian language would be able to, to teach English there and be able to hang out with the kids. And, and they were, you know, my, my kids had a ministry there. My youngest, she would actually interpret for our... Um, our MA who was teaching the little kids uh, English lessons so she would translate into Indonesian what she was saying. Uh, my, my middle daughter had a ministry for the, some of the expat girls that uh, she called Diva Divos and they would get together and they would do a devotional and then have a craft time. My son had a, a ministry for the expat boys where she, he would do uh, a chess club and he would talk about the strategy of winning in life and do these devotionals and then they would learn to play chess. Um, super cool and I love the fact that my family is fully involved in ministry. The next slide, um, this is the Esperanza House. The Esperanza House is our girls' home that we opened up in August 17, 2007. We home 18 girls there who, if not for that home, most likely would stay in their village after, gradu- or after finishing elementary school, and the parents would shortly after uh, marry them off at 13, 14, and 15 years old, uh, pretty much giving them a life of no hope but being a... Being, being a mom and, and, and just, you know, working the rice fields where they can come to Esperanza House and they can uh, get out the further their education through junior high and high school at the Christian high school on the, the Bible college campus. And then if they so desire, they can either go to the Bible college or we also help them go on to other colleges to be able to further their education. These are, these are all things that's happened in our last term. God had taken us initially from being missionaries to Sulawesi, and then (coughs) two years before our term was up, God called my wife to become the field coordinator of all the missionaries in Indonesia, so then he broadened that to all of Indonesia. My wife was traveling all over Indonesia, kind of as a pastor to missionaries in some way, and, and so she was responsible for a lot there, and then when natural disasters hit, I was the guy they called to go into the areas, and uh, my wife explained, described me as I'm the guy that a lot of people who run away from fires, I'm the one running into the fire. Um, I can remember earthquake in Lombok and all these foreigners are trying to get out. They're, they're in the uh, airport waiting and here I arrive two days later and they're all looking at me like, what are you doing? You know, they're trying to get off and I'm getting in. So God opened up super cool opportunities in that. You know, I say all that to tell you this. Thank you. Thank you for supporting your church's missions program here. Because when you guys do that, it empowers them to support us. And when all these churches support us, we're able to go and do what God's called us to do. And I want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Um, And I truly mean that. And I know there's some individuals here that have supported us in the past as well. And I say thank you to you guys as well. Now God is doing a new thing. Um. God expanded us from Indonesia now to all 40 countries of the Asia-Pacific region. Um, Before I get into too much detail, we have a quick video I just want to play uh, for you, if if we can jump to that. I think we got it. Maybe. Dropped it on, I can give a heads up. Well, as I get that ready, I'll go ahead and start explaining to what God has called us to. So, um, in 2000... The unfinished task is the greatest epidemic of our lifetime. For over a hundred years, men and women have labored, forging a path to the never reached traversing uncharted territories, pioneering new movements, risking life, limb, and even family. But with their yes, they challenge governmental authorities, face hostile ideologies, and darken the doors of demonic strongholds. Unwavering in their conviction, they stood up for the oppressed and defended the afflicted. They contended for the miraculous, believed for the impossible, hoped for revival, and saw heaven come to earth. 
Those who've gone before us went where no one else had yet been willing to go. In their dreams, they saw the very faces of generations who have not heard and may never hear. They did not go for clout or recognition, likes or comments. They sacrificed everything so that one more could hear. Their simple obedience built the very foundation our missions movement stands on and paved the way for us to do bigger, better, and faster. What will we do to honor these heroes of faith? Is this the end of their story or the beginning of ours? The urgency of this unfinished task has not diminished. This is the heart of God. Today, we stand upon the shoulders of giants. Their ceiling is our floor. It's our turn to journey to the ends of the earth. Will our yes endure? Will we stand in the gap for a generation who has not yet heard? Wake up! Don't delay! The nations are ready for a harvest. Let's make history. Together, our yes will see heads lifted, darkness tremble, territories taken, churches planted, sickness retracted, visions fulfilled, souls saved, the broken restored, his kingdom come, and his will is done. Take the baton and charge ahead. Don't let this moment pass or complicate the call. This is a convergence, an assembly, a movement compelled by the mandate, go into all nations. We were made for this. The never reach are not numbers and need, percentages or pleas. These are people, faces and voices of those that need to be reached. They've waited long enough. They're waiting on us. I love that video. It says, talks about those who went before us, the, the missionaries that went before us into those places, and, and we are now standing on their shoulders, you know, and I, I've stood on the shoulders of those giants. I, I've stood on what they've, what they've established for us, and it's kind of cool now because now I'm starting to see people starting to stand on my shoulders a little bit, and so it's really, really awesome to be part of this. So um, in 2019, uh, we had our regional uh, leadership approach us about taking on some new roles. Um, long story with it all, but uh, it had nothing to do with COVID. Uh, so we actually was on the way back before COVID ever happened, and I was asked to be the director of natural disasters for the Asia-Pacific uh, region with Assemblies of God. Uh, it's a, a position we've never had, and in fact, they couldn't even tell me what it looked like, <laughs> other than they wanted me to work alongside with Convoy of Hope and partner with them and be able to, to better link our relationship with Convoy of Hope as well as be able to utilize their resources to be able to benefit our missionaries on the field. And it's been such an awesome thing to even uh, go through this process and try to figure out what that all looks like. You know, something I, I propose to you guys is I'm... I've not gotten approval for this yet, but I would like to, because with what I'm doing is, is when natural disaster happens and COVID has released us, uh, I will be leading teams in from Convoy of Hope to do natural disaster relief. And I have a lot of churches approach me and go, we'd love to be a part of that. Can we come along? I, I don't know. I talked to Convoy and they're like, no, we can't do anybody but Convoy. But what I'm, what I'm thinking and, and if something that I, I see your church and I see... I, I think it'd probably be something maybe we could partner with in the future is a second phase, meaning not the initial response, but say, for instance, I go, and then I'm calling your pastor and say, hey, I'm heading over, you know, it's two days after the response. I'll be back in two weeks. I'm looking at three or four weeks to take another team over that'll be able to do a phase two rebuilding, reconstruction, cleanup, or whatever. So it's just one of those things I'm looking to do in that. And so maybe we'll talk later about, you know, if your church would be something to partner with that as well. My wife, if you go to the next slide, has one of the coolest jobs ever. She's the director of a ministry called Asia's Little Ones. Has anybody ever heard of Asia's Little Ones? Okay, that's normal, surprisingly. It's actually been around since 1990. It's an incredible ministry, but the former director did a lot with corporate funding. Well, when he left, the corporate funding left with him. So my wife now is trying to take it back to a grassroots type situation. And what she does, my, it's, 
It gets tricky because my wife has to raise funds for Asia's little ones, which does not pay her salary. And then I, you know, we raise funds for Tim and Doris Eckert's ministry, which that's what pays my salary, and she's on a volunteer basis. It's kind of a weird deal. But Asia's little ones is a um, is a ministry of the Asia Pacific office that helps with homes, health, and education throughout the region of Asia Pacific. Um, she has 23 different projects in 11 different countries, some incredible ministries that she's helping to, to resource, and as soon as she's able to travel, she will go in and she will help improve those ministries as well. So when you partner with Tim and Doris Eckert, you're actually partnering with Church planning in Sulawesi, we continue to do that. Uh, mobilization relief and response across Asia Pacific. You're partnering with Asia's little ones and equipping pastors and church planners for discipleship. What do we need? You know, I'd love to say I'm just here because I love to preach and I do love to preach, but we have a need, uh, and I'm throwing that out at you. This actually, these numbers are a little off. I believe we're probably uh, closer to $1,200 monthly support still need reach to to have our monthly budget and roughly $50,000 to reach 100% of our cash budget. And above all else, we ask for your prayers. I mean, to be honest, I, I you know, it sounds cliche, but we covet your prayers above all else. I know there's times that God has acted on behalf of people praying for us. So will you partner with us? Will you pray, with, for, pray for the never reached? Will you give to support missions? And will you go where God calls you? So this morning, your pastor has given me six chapters of the Bible and says, pick something to preach from this. And all those six chapters is Jesus' sermon. I'm like, how do you pick from Jesus' sermon to try to better that? I thought about just reading it. You know, I think that probably... Uh, uh, Probably more, it probably been more beneficial than me trying to expound on what Jesus had to say, but I'm going to try my best. This morning I want to speak to you about walking in full trust in a world full of options. You know, coming back to the States, having my kids navigate the world that the, we live in these days is scary. Uh, you know, I've had to explain things to my kids at a younger age than I ever should have. You know, their innocence are, are quickly lost. How do, how do we navigate that today? In our society today, I believe Satan has turned us over to ourselves. Um, we are no longer reliant on God. We get sick, we go to the hospital. If we need money, we, we go borrow money. You know, we, I, now please don't, I'm not saying this is, Everybody in full, I hope. You know, and I, and not, nor am I saying it's bad that we have these resources of medical technology and having financial uh, availability to us is wrong. I'm not saying that in any way. But all too often, we are quick to turn to our own resources than we do to God. So why don't we see miracles like they do in other countries? Well, because we don't place ourselves in a position to need a miracle. Um, our medical care is top notch, and we should never abandon that. But we far quick, we are far quick to turn to a doctor than we are to God. We'll continue on prescription meds for the rest of our lives, but we won't find time to fast and pray over a meal or two. If you open up your Bibles or you follow with me on the screen, uh, Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 10. I believe this is a, a passage all you guys should have memorized today. Is that correct? Uh, this was, I was told, your memory memorization or memory verse for the week that you're supposed to be working on. We're going to look at this, and uh, we are going to dive into it this morning. Luke 11, 9 says, And so I tell you, keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open for you, to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that your word is timeless. Lord, that, that your word is, is just as relevant now as it was when it was written. God, Lord, we pray that your word will speak to us today. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and do your work in each of our lives. God, lead us to where it is you want us to be. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as I read this passage and as I pondered on this passage, there's a couple questions that I have. The first question is, why don't people ask, seek, or knock? Why don't people ask, seek, or knock? I think the first answer is often we forget who God is. 
We forget who God is. Uh, we see uh, God loves you and wants to be in a relationship with you. I mean, that's who God is. God, God created you so that he can have relationship with you, know you personally, know you, who you are, and be a, a, every part of your life. We see this in Romans 5, 8. We see in John 3, 16. We see it in James 4, 8. And the list can go on and on and on where God just wants to hear from you. I'd seen a uh, deal on Facebook that said, you know, the difference between our a, a, a proper understanding of God is like when you, I'm, I'm, I'm going to butcher this here, you mess up, is your response, oh no, my dad's going to kill me, or you mess up, oh no, I need to go talk to my dad. You know what, we, we are not, we do not have a God that is looking to strike you down, we don't have a God that wants to see you in pain, we don't have a God that wants to continue to, to see you continue to struggle we have a loving God that wants to just be in relationship with you. He wants to hear your needs. He wants to hear your desires. He wants to know more about you. He knows completely about you, but he wants you to express that to him. We have a God who cares for you. We see that in Jeremiah 29, 11, Psalms 139, 16 through 17, Romans 8, 28 through 29. We have a God who has a plan for you. Think about that. Eight billion people on the earth, and God has a plan for you. He has a special design plan he wants for your life. We see that play out in 1 Peter 2, 9. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. God has a plan for you. And then we see that as a, with God, nothing is impossible Right? Philippians 4.13. Nothing is impossible with God. You know, I was in prayer one time. I, I would often take, and we had a book of unreached people groups or never reached people groups of Indonesia as a whole, and I'd take the, the South Sulawesi section, and I would just read through. My heart would break of millions upon millions upon millions of people. In fact, the tribe that we feel God calling us to is the Boogies tribe. The Boogies tribe is a tribe of six million people, and less than one hundredth of a percent of them are Christian. 0.01 percent are Christian. Some some statistics say zero, or uh, I think they say about two thousand people out of six million are followers of Jesus. And my heart would just break, and I can remember I was praying one day. I'm like, God. Let me see a million boogies come to know you. God said, what? A million boogies? Why would you even pray for a million boogies when there's six million going to hell? See, I, I felt I was, you know, I was being pretty brave. I felt like I was being pretty bold asking for a million God said, there's six million of them I love. There's six million of them that I died for. Why are you praying for just a million? Man, I learned to pray bold. I learned to pray and understand who God is. I learned that God is a big God and there's nothing impossible with him. I think the second reason that often we don't ask, knock, and seek is we forget who we are. We forget who we are. See, you are a child of God. You are a child of God. John, 1 John 3, 1, uh, Galatians 3, 26, 2 Corinthians 6, 18, all tell us this. You know, I, I, you guys, I mean, that's, that's a, sometimes we say that and it just kind of in church. We're like, yeah, I'm a child of God. But do you understand the implications of what that is? To be the child of God means we get his inheritance. It means there's going to be a day where we will stand and worship him. And being a child of God means we are set apart. Man, you know what? I'm a lot less brave to go ask some stranger for something than I am my dad. My dad, I, you know, my wife just got rear-ended uh, a couple weeks ago, and, and we're going to be borrowing my mom and dad's car. I was much more brave to go ask to borrow their extra car 
than I was the guy down the street I didn't even know, right? You know, there's a relationship, there's a, there's a connection, and whenever I have that understanding of this is my, my dad that I'm talking to, God is my father, it makes it where, you know what? I feel released to ask. You have to understand you are wonderfully made. Psalms 1, 39, 14. And Jesus died for you, John 3, 16. There's Peter 3, 18 and 1 John 22. I'm sorry, 2. 1 John 2, 2. God is your Father. And we see continuing in Luke there, Luke 11, uh, 11 through 13, it says, You fathers, if you ask for a fish, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if you ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. If you sinful people... Uh, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give to the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Now, funny story with this verse here. In Indonesia, in the, the area of Irian Jaya, it's, if you know where Papua New Guinea is, it actually half the island is Irian Jaya, Indonesia, or they call it Papua Indonesia. Um, there's some tribes there that one of the greatest things they can get is snake. They love eating snake. And so when they read this verse, it's like, that dad's a sucker, man. He had a kid asked for a fish and gives him, a, you know, he wouldn't give him a snake. A snake is awesome. And so they had to actually change it around. But you guys get what it's saying. It's saying God isn't going to give you something that's going to harm you. He isn't going to give you something that, that isn't, isn't what you're asking for. When I was a youth pastor in Missoula, Montana, there was a lady in our church. She often said, she said I'm, we were like talking about the will of God. And she said, you know, I'm, I'm scared to ask God what the will, his will for my life is. I was like, why? You know, for me, man, I understand this, this relationship with God and just the awesomeness that comes when I ask and he guides and directs, you know. Sometimes I don't understand why, but it, you know, I said, why would you be scared to ask what the will of God is? She goes, well, I'm afraid he's going to call me to be barefoot pregnant in China. Really? God isn't set out to, to make your life miserable. He isn't set out to try to bring you harm. He isn't set out to make life rough on you. He wants and desires for you to succeed. He wants to see you thrive. He wants to see the best for you. As a father, I want to provide everything my kid needs. I want to answer their questions and do so based off of their maturity and their age, right? I don't know, uh, where's babies come from? My little kid this big, I don't tell them the full story, you know what I mean? But as they get older and as they mature, I reveal more to them. God is the same way with us. So what should we be asking for? Well, we should be, we, what we shouldn't be asking for is things of fleshly desire. Um, God is not a genie in the bottle. He's not an ATM. We do not hold to the name and claim a heresy uh, either. Th those are, I, you know, I don't know. I, I'm assuming you don't. So if you do, I'm sorry if I'm stepping on your toes, but I'm not. Um, <laughs> that is just a bunch of malarkey. If you think that you can go out and you can pray for something and God's going to give it to you because he's entitled to, that's nonsense. God cares more about your obedience than your wealth. God, you know, I heard somebody once say, if, I, if you go out and you pray for that, that lay your hands on that Mercedes and you pray for it, God's got to give it to you. God says, no, I don't. Man, I tell you what, if you are gauging how good someone has it by how wealthy they are, you have eyes of this world. I tell you, some of the greatest people I know didn't have anything financially. But you know what, they had love and they had people that you can't, you know, you, you had things that money could never buy. We shouldn't be desiring, God says, ask, I'm going to ask. You know, God's going to say, you know, just like my son says, you know, when he was little, maybe he said, Dad, I want to eat ice cream for dinner. I'm like, ah, that's funny. No, you're not. Uh, you know, God's going to do that to us. <laughs> so when we, well, what should we be asked for? Well, when we draw close to Jesus, we'll find out his desires or our desires will start Falling in line with his desires. See, that's a really cool thing. See, what Jesus is talking about, this ask, seek, and knock, is, is that he's saying, 
Draw close to me. Start learning and falling in line with me. And the, your desires are going to start falling in line with God's desires. And when you ask for things that God desires, that ultimately is where you're going to see him answer those prayers. This can come in the form of salvation, uh, of healings, of just growing closer to God. You know, these, it's, it's so cool when you ask for something and, and, and you're like, you kind of have a little doubt. And then all of a sudden God says, here you go. And you're like, it worked. <laughs> but whenever your request falls in line with his will, you will see his answer come to pass. Thirdly, above all else, God is a mystery and that he wants to reveal that to you. But he will not reveal it to you in small pieces. He will only reveal it to you in small pieces and only if you truly want it. God, God is such a marvelous mystery and, and, and he wants to reveal himself to you. You ever had somebody ask you a question they didn't really want to know the answer to? Or they weren't as interested in it as you were, you know? Or maybe you've done that just trying to make small talk. I, I was with a friend last night, and I was like, hey, so what exactly do you do? And he started into his job, and I started just blanking out. You know, I really didn't care that much about why he did. But he went into very detail. You know, I've, I've, I've been those places, people are like, so tell me about Indonesia. I start talking, and you see this is blank look, and I'm like, ah, I'm shutting her down. <laughs> they don't really care. God's like that. If you don't really want to know who he is, he isn't going to reveal himself to you. He doesn't have the, he's not, we see with Jesus. Jesus had the Pharisees saying, show us a miracle. He's like, I'm not a magician. I'm not just here for your, for, for, to prove to you, but if you truly want to know God, he wants to reveal himself to you. He wants to show himself to you in full. See, walking in full trust is always taking away the safety nets. The only way we trust anyone to that degree is by knowing them so intimately that there's no doubt in who they are and who we are to them. Man, you want to walk in full trust of God, you've got to grow close to God. You've got to just understand who He is and understand who you are to Him. And we will see great things happen, church. We have to do that. We have to go there. We have to rise up to that. Pastor? A few thoughts of reflection as uh, Tim was sharing from the word there that I just want to share with you. A parallel passage to this is Jesus says, if, if you as earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to your children, and how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask him? Uh, our God is good, and from his hand come good things in the midst of the stuff that we walk through day in and day out. And you think about these uh, things that he said God desires. He desires to see people saved. It's a salvation. He uh, works in amazing ways, bringing healing over people in a variety of ways. And he wants people to draw close to him. And I believe that there's most likely a variety of walks of life in this room where people are going through some of those very things. And I, if we hear anything today of the ask, seek, and knock is, is drawing close to God and letting him move upon those circumstances.